The Wall Street Journal calls Charles Barber's new book, In the Blood, the captivating, often cinematic story of how a medical innovation was improbably developed, fiercely resisted, and ultimately adopted. In a classic David vs. Goliath story, two civilians stood up to the U.S. Army and stopped the killing. Blocked for years by the hubris and interest sig I'm going to intro. You know what? I'm going to just take out that part and then... uh Go with the uh, the beginning. I can't say that word. Intransigence. 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 Some doctor I am. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Bart, Charlie, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Protectors. We're here to talk about the book In the Blood. I'm super excited about this because I think I've kind of been along the lines for the past 30 years following the inception of the quick clot from you know the beginning until it got accepted by the military well, first rejected, but then slowly getting accepted. But this is a must-read book, In the Blood. Let's talk about it. How's it going, guys? Doing great. Great, Great, Jason. Thanks for having us. Now, Charlie and Bart, how did you two link up? Um, We met through a mutual friend 11 years ago to the day, I think, you know, like around this time of year, and... Bart had just theoretically retired, although he's pretty busy still these days um, with this book and many other things. But he had retired from the company that made Quick Clot. And he was in, uh, it was this in Old Saber, Connecticut, and he had a house on the shore. And I had a moment with him, and he told me he had just retired. And I said, What did you do? And he said, My partner and I invented a product that clotted blood that kind of, was a really unusual product that my partner came up with a really miraculous idea. And um, we brought it to the military, but the army resisted it, but we won. And now it's in every first aid kit of every soldier and Marine. And I said, wow, that might be a book. And here we are 11 years later. When you talk about being resisted, I could only imagine the bureaucracy you had to go through Bart to get this product into the military's hand. Now I joined in 1993 and we were still using the same Vietnam era bandages and the same packs and the same everything. There was no modernization that was at the field level. So when did you first develop this and when did you first try to get it on market? Well, Charlie, do you want us to tell a story of when Frank actually invented it? Sure. The, the, the story I'll, set it up for Bart when he gets involved. But Jason, as you, I'm sure, know and experienced even that time in the 90s when you joined, there was a race to find a blood clotting agent. And if you look at what was used to stanch blood on the battlefield in not, not only the Crimean War, but going back to the Trojan War all the way through the Desert Storm, it was basically the same stuff. It was gauze and pressure. Mm-hmm. And in the Battle of Mogadishu, the Black Hawk Down incident, it it put ne- negative publicity, uh, but also just a spotlight on the military's inability to stop bleeding for brave soldiers. The climax of Black Hawk Down, the movie and the book, is a, is a Corporal Jamie Smith bleeding out and the the medic, he can't get evacuated because there's too much fire and he bleeds out over hours. And it put this, it started this race to find a blood clotting agent and the military, all branches or most branches put in hundreds of millions of dollars to find a blood clotting agent. And while that was going on, my partner, Frank Hersey, long prior to it, in fact, what was, what was the year, Charlie? 83. 1983, my partner, who is uh, a bit of a rare bird. He is a genius. He is the kind of person who looks at complex problems and creates simple solutions. 
I call him a super person. I call myself his only link to reality. He, uh, he had found that zeolite, which is the product we were using in our oxygen generators to separate molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, to isolate the oxygen, to make oxygen available to patients and for various industrial uses. He found, he discovered that the, the zeolite, when it was in vacuous form, it permeated water first. In other words, it gathered all the water molecules first. And it left the platelet molecules. This was his belief because the platelet molecules are very physically large, complex molecules. It, it left them out. So Frank, in his genius, did exactly the opposite of what every medical person throughout history had been trying to do. Rather than add additional clotting factors to the blood to make it clot and running all the risks of all the organisms, mm -hmm. bacteria that might come along with it and viruses, what he did was he said, well, let's just take away the water and create a powerful hemoconcentration that makes the blood essentially clot by itself. So you're not adding any foreign matter. All you're doing is taking things away. And that simple, that simple way to look at it was completely revolutionary. And that's why Frank was revolutionary. Now, when you're talking about the quick clot, I mean, believe me, I mean, if they had this for hundreds of years before that, Vietnam, and you're talking 83, we had Grenada, then we had Just Cause later on. We're not even talking about training accidents and just everyday applications. We're not even touching on law enforcement applications or emergency responders applications. But to go from 1983, when you have the concept of like basically your concept of operation or concept to taking how long after that? I mean, well, I got involved. Because we're talking Frank about the in, battle. I'm sorry. Uh, I got involved with Frank in 99. And uh, Frank is a scientist. Frank's not a marketing guy. And Frank had a business making oxygen and nitrogen air separation systems. I got involved with him. Fortunately, answered an ad that he was he had in the Hartford Current for a partner, but then he decided he didn't want a partner. So uh, I had been doing nothing for uh, about a year and a half since I'd moved to Connecticut from Long Island, and I s looked at his systems, I looked at the machines, I I looked at Frank, and I thought this is the most honest guy I've ever met. And if there's anybody in the world I want to do business with, it's an honest guy. So I started, I started with him. And one of the things we developed was a system called the POGS uh, as our business grew. The POGS is a portable oxygen generation system that is used by pretty much every branch of the military now. It generates 60 liters of oxygen a minute. It's, uh, it's ideal to gang together. It's ideal for any medical facility downrange or close to downrange. And it can be dropped out of an airplane and survive. So uh, we were working with the Marines, who I found to be terrific, uh, mainly because they have a very, they have a, we are contrarians, Frank and myself. I'm definitely a contrarian. And the Marines are kind of the contrarians of the military. Now, being, being special forces, uh, the special forces guy are the smarter contrarians of the military. Uh, but I found the Marines great to work with. I worked with a guy named uh, Master Chief Tom Eagles who was obviously in the Navy. He was a corpsman. He had served six tours in Vietnam. And when he passed away, he was the, he was the uh, most highly decorated Vietnam corpsman uh, in the history of the war. He had, uh, is it four? Uh, how four many purple hearts, multiple bronze stars. 
and of course the um, he was the only flying cross. Yeah, and he had the Croix de Guerre, and uh, he was the only non-pilot to ever win the DFC Distinguished Flying Cross because he had his pilot and co-pilot killed in the air. He took the controls and landed the helicopter. So this guy is just this guy is just uh, Superman, and highly highly respected. And he was the uh, he was essentially the head of medical for the Marine Corps. And I was working with him on the Pogs, and I, uh, we developed a pretty good personal relationship. And I was talking with him, and he said, "Well, that his responsibility was to create a new IFAC. That was his long range responsibility." Along the way, we were talking, and he said, "You know, I've had a, I've had a, I've had a crummy day. Uh, the brass is on my ass because we have to find a blood clotting product, and it's never going to happen. They've been trying for a million years, and they'll never find anything that really works. But there's a test coming up that I've got to help administer. It's going to happen at Bethesda, and I said, Tom." We have uh, we have a blood clotting product. And he said to me, Bart, you're a good guy. I like you. Don't be one of those contractors that just goes to make the cash. Uh, that's that's not who I am or that's not who I would ever be. Uh, I'd like five minutes in a closed room with each one of those guys. I actually nearly had it once, but that's another story. Uh, I said, Tom, we've got the product. I don't even know if it works for sure, but we have it. About three days later, Tom called me back and said, one of the products dropped out. We've got to fill in with another product. You want to send your stuff? So I went to Frank. We pulled out the, uh, we actually went to the barrel where we kept our, uh, our zeolite. We pulled out a handful we uh, put it in a plastic bag. We uh, nuked it so it would be vacuumed. It would create a vacuum, wrapped it up, and sent it to Bethesda. I was invited to come down to talk about the protocol. So no military, uh, no military medical experience, no medical experience. I walk into this meeting with probably 15 guys, the other products, who all had more initials after their name than are in the alphabet. And they're all bitching and moaning about the protocol. And they want to change the protocol. And I sat there for an hour and a half listening to each guy trying to change the protocol to fit their product. And it finally came. I was the last product, so... Uh, Commander Joe DeCorda, Lieutenant Commander Joe DeCorda, amazing guy, helped us a lot, said to me, I'd never met him before, but he said, okay, what about Quick Clot? Uh, what do you guys think of the protocol? I said the only thing that any logical person would say. I said, you know, I don't know a single warrior who's able to choose the way he's going to be wounded. So... Throw whatever you have at it, and let's see if it works. And uh, they set up. They set up the testing. They tested six pigs. I watched one test, and our product performed very well. I then left. About uh, two weeks later, I got a call from Hassan Alam, Doctor Hassan Alam, who was the guy from Mass General who ran the test, and his exact words were. Uh, You've got quite a product there. Charlie, <laughs> what were the exact words? You're the guy with the memory. You've got a historic product. You've got an historic product there. And at the same time, he sent me an email with a bar graph. I'm not a bar graph guy. <laughs> I'm not a graph guy. I looked at it, and there were all the other products that were being tested listed. And uh, there was a blank space where our product was. And I said, what happened? Did our product, uh, there's, there's, there's no bar for our product. And he said, 
you have to look at the left side. That's the number of pigs that bled out and died. Hmm. You were the only product that had no pig bleed out and, and die. In fact, the next best product in performance was cotton gauze. Hmm. So it all began from there. The Marines helped us. Uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps sent a letter to the FDA. We submitted our application, which the uh, which the bleeding head of the FDA walked me through the application, told me exactly what to put on the application. We sent it in, and three weeks later, we were cleared. And a week later, we were in the on the battlefield. We were downrange on the field uh, with the Marines. Now, all, while all this was going on, am I going too far here, or should I? No, keep going. I want to. I'm ready to find out what's going on because I want to know where how the um, Marines. Yeah, let's get it in there. War fighters. The Marines, fighting the the fight. Marines yeah. were terrific. They grabbed a hold of it and they ran with it. And their attitude was, "Let's get it. Let's get it in the right hands right now." So it went down range all at the same time while all this was going on. After Mogadishu, there was a surgeon named John Holcomb. Colonel John, he was a full bird colonel. He was a surgeon at Mogadishu, as I said, and he had a rough time. But he was awarded highly for being there, and his stock was very high. He moved up very quickly. He became the head of the Institute for Surgical Research, which is essentially is the research arm of the Army. Uh he found a product working with the Red Cross that was called the Red Cross Bandage that used a uh, that used a thrombin base, and uh, was it was the classic army thing where they said it was ready long before it was ready. It never even made it to it never even made it to Fayetteville. It never got into the hands of the soft guys. It. Uh, kept getting delayed, delayed, delayed. But while it was being delayed, it was promised and promised and promised. And suddenly from $100 in application, it went to $10,000 in application. But meanwhile, I went to my first uh, military trauma conference, ATAC, in, uh, in Florida. And the first time I saw John Holcomb, he was receiving an award from the entire body for solving the problem of sanguination in the battlefield. So here he is. He's, he's the head guy. He knows it all. He opens his mouth and it comes out a double blind, a double blind study. Everybody believes it. Uh, the only problem was he didn't have the answer. And it was one of those things where uh, you've already been given the cup for winning the race, but you're only halfway down the course. Mm -hmm. So he started to grope. He found another product that was ironically from a company that was started and operated by an old colleague of his at, uh, at uh, ISR, uh, another full bird colonel, and another group of colonels investing in it, who were also military medical people. It used shrimp shells. It extracted, it extracted the, uh, the product, the chitosan, from shrimp shells. They made it into a disc, and that was supposed to stop bleeding. Well, in the lab, it worked perfectly. But meanwhile, this is a real-life scenario in a real-life environment. Uh, Holcomb, Dr. Holcomb, Colonel Holcomb, because he was who he was, was able to get, was just money was just poured on him. I believe, what was the figure that finally was? $70 million was oh my the branch of the port. And that, this became, Jason, this became Hemcon that was widely used by the Army circa 02 to, to 05, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it never worked properly. It never worked in the field. Uh, the first iteration of it, it was supposed to be completely free of any shrimp aspect and would never go bad. It was fully synthesized. Unfortunately, it went down range in an ISO container, was left on the tarmac for three days. And when they opened the ISO container, uh, the essence of shrimp was still there mm -hmm. with extreme prejudice. So... Holcomb was in a position where he had signed on with Hemcon. He couldn't go back. Our product, our product had to die. Our product couldn't make it to the field. In spite of the okay. fact that our this is, was this is where I, this is what I'm talking about right here. Because yeah. I'm, I'm the bureaucracy. And, and you know, as anybody that's been served any time in the government or military and uh as I have for the past 30 years up until I retired, I understand a bureaucracy and I understand these. And I did work for the defense logistics at one time. So uh, I so do know. understand how these contracts go and how they're driven and how the, the money and the power that be and how you can word contracts in order to get them granted. And when we're talking about something as important as quick, I mean, you're talking 1983 from the concept. And then we're talking about when was the first. So you're talking about 99 is when you had the first application available. So the FDA approved. So it was Frank came up with the idea in 1983. And as Bart alluded to, he's just not a marketer. So he had it. He, he did write a patent. The patent had actually expired by the time that Bart showed up. So it was really kind of in his head. But he had actually tested it on a mouse that he bought at a pet store in his basement in the fall of 83 and then he had used that to work mouse, by the way is at the living at the happy mouse ranch now as we speak and was not harmed in the uh, making of it, this. it survived it, it scampered away in his backyard and then he used to work at hartford hospital and so he got in touch with a, a surgeon and did proper medical tests on mm -hmm. animals proved that it worked but had no servability to move it forward beyond that. Bart and Frank meet up in 99. Bart's the marketer. 9-11 happens. That test that Bart referred to happens. And it gets sprung into the world in summer 02. Mm -hmm. And is very quickly in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so a lot of this story is the military's not the Marines and the Navy, but other parts of the military, their distrust and inability to, sorry about the dog, uh, to um, tolerate people with, without military or medical credentials. And one would hope and think that the data would drive the process, but that was not the case here. And, uh, so it took a six year struggle to win Bart and Frank and the soldiers and Marines won, but it was a six year struggle between Oh two and Oh eight. This episode brought to you by Blackstone publishing out now for my good friends, Andrews and Wilson is the sandbox. Listen, this is no terminator. This antagonist is well beyond the terminator. This is an AI that knows everything. It's always one step ahead. Now, how do you track down a killer, a serial killer, an alpha killer? Well, add in an incredible protagonist with an Army CID background and now a homicide detective, and you have got the sandbox. I've been listening to this. I absolutely love it. I am probably about a quarter of the way through, but I highly recommend this book, whether it's audio, whether it's paper, hardback or whatever read this listen to it now i am hooked check out the sandbox by andrews and wilson out now everywhere where books are sold well you know i really want to talk about that and that's one of the reasons i want to read this book is because the battles that be the to get a product a life-saving product to full scale you know the the marines only have a, a certain footprint on a battlefield Right. It's not a large scale footprint like the the army is and and the other some of the other branches that support them, but to get it into everybody's individual first aid kit to get it onto their body 
to where they could, you know, save life and limb to go from, you know, we're talking back in, I, I deployed in 06 and we're talking about like a long, any time frame between when the GWAT started is too long. Right. You know, we were fielding everything and anything. You know, I went from, like I said, I went from the Cold War military into the, into the, the wartime military and we were still rolling around with Vietnam era stuff. Right. But I remember when I got my first kit to go overseas that they were throwing like Oakley's at us, new boots, new uniforms, new this, new that. Cool guy gear. But I want to see, I want to see for one tourniquets. The other thing is I want to see like quick class should have been on everybody's kit. And uh, were you, were you a ranger? Were you, you were special forces, right? No, I was just infantry. I was attached to the special forces guy, but I was just a staffer. I wasn't okay. special. Well, special, that's, you know, special forces pretty much has carte blanche. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say that special forces had it on the same day the Marines had it. Uh, Because, you know, special forces just can take anything they want, buy anything they want, and uh, no, no ramifications. Well, we, the ISR, deemed that the product of choice was now what's the isr oh that's the institute of surgical research that was the institute in san antonio texas that was running army and trauma medicine army trauma medicine and was so influential that had a great deal of influence over the whole of military trauma medicine with the exception of the marines war fighting laboratory and the office of naval research so go ahead sorry no i was gonna say like i remember the resistance to quick clock too i was like and this is in the army side uh some of the medics um uh, to the for the initial unit i was attached to were very hesitant because they're like oh you're gonna get it in your eyes people are gonna go blind they're gonna this and you almost wonder if there was like a false <laughs> like a false flag campaign because of like the military industrial complex of like trying to get certain products to certain people and i'm you know, not to be a conspiracy theory, but you almost wonder if there there was almost like a a negative campaign for quick. Well, I'm or maybe it was just lived, because I'm the guy that lived and was the victim of that campaign, and it brought me to my knees because I'll tell you straight straight up, Frank and I were in this when we realized we had a product that worked. From that moment on, our only goal was to get it into the hands of every warrior who stepped on a transport to go down range. And we lived that every day. And our people who worked for us, 55 or 60 employees, all lived that every day too. To the point that we had a sign in our break room that said, whatever you're doing today, no matter what you're doing today, what you're really doing today is saving lives. And we were at it. We we were just amazed that ISR and the power of ISR, John Holcomb was in effect the ad hoc head of medicine for the army. The surgeon general pretty much answered to him and did whatever he said because he could say, well, the re- research shows. And when somebody who's a researcher says the research shows, you listen to him. Well, not just somebody that says a reacher shows, especially if you're saying this to civilians and you have the, you know, you have the bird on your collar, you have right. whatever rank you are at a time. Right. And, and Jason, what, what the campaign was largely about was there were some drawbacks to the original quick clot formulation. It was granular, so it could fly away in the desert. It, could in the intensity and the, the miraculousness of that absorption process of the water in the blood, it could cause heat in the surrounding tissue. Bart and Frank never denied that. But when, you know, sold when Marines were faced with a risk reward calculus of a serious wound in the, in the battlefield versus a burn around the surrounding tissue, guess what they said? And there were stories of army medics trying to get quick clot, of the British medics training, trading scotch, bottles of scotch to get it, stories of throwing away the Hemcon, mm-hmm. because the Hemcon worked in the lab but not in the field. 
in, unless the wound was like perfectly conformed to the biscuit like wafer that it was. Also, the actual research, because I'm the storyteller, but also the 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 researcher and the data guy, there was a retrospective study of a hundred odd uses of quick clot, both in the battlefield and in emergency rooms in Los Angeles. And out of 103 uses, there were three significant burns, only one of which required treatment. Second degree burns. Right. And so, however, what, so this is to put it in the 99, the Bard and Frank meet up test is in 2002. It gets to the battlefield and later in 02, this war with the army goes on between 02 and, and 08. Bart. And because, because Colonel Holcomb was controlling the research at ISR, they could arrange and do exactly what I talked about earlier about the protocol. Set up the protocol so that quick clot always failed, mm-hmm. uh, or they would measure a 100 degrees Celsius, which was a myth with quick clot. And their product always succeeded because they always manipulated it to make it look that way. So we were real. We realized we we were not going to sell our product to the army from the top down, and that's essentially the way to do it. Just like with the Marines, the uh, procurement guys contact you; they mm-hmm. give you an order. You provide a very large amount. It goes to a depot and sits there for too long, but eventually gets distributed. No, we weren't, that wasn't going to stop us though. So what we did was we spent some time and we found out about impact cards. Oh yeah. Yep. Impact, impact cards are credit cards with a $2,500 limit that every smaller unit has to get essentials. We had impact cards from individual units lined up buying quick clot. So instead of one or two orders for 3 million units, we were selling individual units at $2,500 for as much as we could provide. Then we found out that wives and mothers, once (laughs) they found out about our product, they were doing bake sales and fundraisers and everything they could to buy our product. So what we started doing was selling from the bottom up. I was at another ATAC conference, Army Trauma Conference, and that was the place where I usually, those who bought the story from Colonel Holcomb would would tell me that I was a war profiteer, that I had no morality. But... I was standing there, and a and a full bird came along from. I didn't know where he was from. Well, I kind of recognized the big red one, and uh, he said, "Tell me about this." So I told. I didn't know who he was. Told him about it. He said, "Well, I'm the divisional surgeon, and I don't give a crap what the lab rats in Houston say." If this will save my guys' lives, I want it. We'll be ordering. And that was our big breakthrough. Then the divisional surgeons started ordering for their divisions. And that was sticking our head a little too far above the hedgerow. Because when ISR found out about that... Now you put a target on you. They issued a dictum that quick clot was outlawed. Quick clot was not to be used in the army because it was too dangerous. And meanwhile, Jason, one of the stories in the book is a guy that's become a friend of ours, a lieutenant in in the army. Right after Thanksgiving 05, he is in Iraq. The vehicle that he's in drives over a, a, a bomb. The two guys he's in with are killed instantly. He's thrown 150 feet. He loses. His name is Ryan Kuehls. He's currently a senior program officer for the Wounded Warrior Project in D.C. And federal legislation has been named after him. 
a few years ago. He loses an arm and a leg. The medics have a hard time finding him. He gets thrown so far. He is given quick clot. And it's one of the things that saves his life. And, but this is in, this is November 05. This is when it is verboten by the army. So we're actually, I'm working on a follow-up article from the book. I'm trying to find the medic that treated him. How did he get that quick clot? Because it was, as Bart said, it was, uh, it, it was not under the army's, uh, you know, approved status at that point. So well, this is where, I'm sorry. No, no, this go, ahead. Where, go ahead. Bart. This is where the, the distance between the quote unquote lab rats at Fort Sam Houston and the actual field itself worked in our favor because there was enough quick plot out there and we were still getting the orders. The fact that it was outlawed meant that when the wrong guy found it, he would pick it up and take it and turn it in. But <laughs> as you know, there are a lot more right guys down range than mm -hmm. there are wrong guys. And the right guys made sure it was still available. But the battle went on and it was, it was brutal. And it took a personal toll on Frank and myself. Well, let's save let's save the battle for the book. Hey, everybody, okay. let me uh, let me tell everybody what the book is, and then we're going to talk. I do want to talk about some other applications for it. Sure. So, in the blood is out now. How two outsiders saw the centuries-old medical mystery and took on the U.S. Army. It's basically it's a classic David versus Goliath story. So I love it, and that's kind of one of the things that I really like. Our audience loves is taking on the man. But in a non-political way, <laughs> we're not partisan here, but no, but seriously, I do want to talk about the other applications. I do want to read this book because at first, you know, I was looking at the title of the book and I'm like, okay, we're just going to talk about scientific methodology and this and that. And I want to hear about getting this to the units. I want to hear about the pushback. I want to, I want to read about all that stuff, but you know, someone that's also come from the, the law enforcement perspective of it, everybody and their brother carries tourniquets now but not everybody's carrying quick clock. And, you know, as someone that comes from both the military and law enforcement perspective, I have tourniquets everywhere, but I don't have quick clot anywhere. And a lot of families are starting to understand that, you know what, in your vehicle, in your cupboards, in your medical kits, you need to have both, not just one, not just a tourniquet, but also the quick clot. But I think that, that adage of uh, it's dangerous for you, it kind of carries over. I think it's, let's talk about, you know, the applications of it now and the safety of it and, you know, why people should be carrying this stuff. That's well, for the new the product, there's a, the, the product that we've been talking about really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, our amazing, our amazing staff went to work and came up with a gauze that was infused with kaolin. Kaolin is, is the new quick clot, and that has absolutely no contraindications, no heat. In fact, works better than the original quick clot, which means we're kind of a two, two miracle company. And uh, that is now available widely. In fact, you probably can't find the granular product anymore, anywhere. But you're right. At the end of the day, a police officer has to be able to uh, self-apply to take care of himself because shootings these days usually or very often involve an officer being trapped in a fire zone where he can't be taken care of and has to take care of himself. And the officer, by the way, is also the true first responder. I mean, who's the first on the scene? It's not the fire fireman. It's not the first responders, the true first responder is the police officer. And the beauty of the kale infused product is, is just standard gauze. It looks like standard hmm. gauze. It performs like standard gauze. It's a roll. You unroll it, you stuff it in the wound, which means essentially anyone who can open that package has the same ability to stop bleeding that a surgeon has back on the table in the hospital 
after transport. But I think, Jason, the tourniquets are omnipresent. Quick clot, if you look at just, say, the ma- the terrible mass shootings that plague our country, it's used at a minority of them. There's penetration, but it's, it's I, you know, it, it's a far, a long way from being complete. And I think the um, the talk about the first product and the exaggeration about the burning, even though that's years ago and completely mm-hmm. solved. And then in the medical community, um, there's a, still a prejudice against what was deemed as a first responder, EMT, you know, paramedic um, product. The fact is this could be used in in the operating room, and it is, but it took years to get acceptance from the, you know, traditional medical community as well. So, you know. Well, Charlie, I got to tell you that right there is like tourniquets. Tourniquets took years. Right. Right. Years. I mean, you, we all remember when, oh, you put a tourniquet on, you're going to lose the limb. Right. You know, exactly. never put a tourniquet on. You know, you got to put time stamps on it. You got to do this. You got to do that. But now it's like, who doesn't have a tourniquet? Right. And it's also the a huge part of this story is money. And you've got people in the, the Marines that we were talking about estimated that the, the Army's budget for trauma medicine was up to a billion dollars a year uh, at the height of the Iraq war. A lot of that was through special congressional dispensations, wasn't necessarily, you know, official. Um, You've got these two guys in Connecticut with, you know, no research money, right? Like literally none. Um, But just speaking currently, quick clot combat gauze, the Kalen product now is still incredibly inexpensive. I haven't looked... On Amazon, but it, what is it, fifty dollars or something like that, Bart? And less, we're, less, forty dollars. We're very pleased because if you go to the book on Amazon, it says often purchased with, and then there's quick mm-hmm. clock on that cause. I think we're the only book, you know, in the in yeah. the history of Amazon that you know a, a product is associated with. But um, the fact, well, tell me this, Charlie. Does the book yeah. dispel the rumors and the myth? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, the story that we just told is but more um because you wisely sort of cut us off to you know the sort of the darker side of the story but also the victory um that bart and frank uh experienced um but but the real struggle but i think the uh, just to finish the point the fact that it's cheap i think can work against it because i think there's a fascination and almost like a uh, a fetish in american medicine um and 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 the military if it's expensive. you know what they're they exact that's with anything you know it comes right. like, as someone who's like who, who lives knives and stuff it's like you could buy the same like some guy right. making a really nice knife for 80 dollars, and someone will charge you a thousand dollars for the same exact product it, exactly Every, so what, and cars too you know i mean it's like still the same yeah exactly and um you, they call it overperformance. the an american fascination with overperformance. You know, an SUV that can climb the Himalayas, but you just needed to go to Walmart, you know? Well, so- you know, I do want to say, like, when you're talking under $50, even if you're talking like $30, $40, the 25. same thing when you- How much? $25. Oh, geez, when you're talking- okay, so that's like one for your car, one for your one for there. And that's the same thing with the tourniquets. You don't want to buy the cheap. I can understand when it comes to tourniquets. You know, you don't want to buy some weird generic one from that just you have no idea where it's from. It's the same thing with this. If you're going to put something on your kit and it's going to save life or limb, 25 bucks, that's like five cups of coffee, 10 yeah. cups of coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if you're going to – and like to me, I I do a lot of competitive shooting now, and I've seen almost all the people now, even though we're just on a flat range shooting all the time, people are – there's tourniquets everywhere. It's the same thing with this. If you have a, If you have the right kit, you could put it on there. It's not going to be heavy. It's not going to be crazy. It's just another another awesome tool to have. Um, same thing with tourniquets. A lot of people are wearing, a lot of law enforcement are wearing like ankle holster type things. Well, now they're making ankle holsters where you can actually have one on one leg and one on the other where you could have like a quick cut. You could have this. Mm-hmm. So right. I'm, I'm really interested in this a lot. And I think the other thing that sort of 
you know, there's still a prejudice against the product, but the company was sold for half a billion dollars a couple of years ago. Bard and Frank had sold it 10 years before that. So it's a, it's a major product. Don't, don't get us wrong, but given its life-saving potential, it should be everywhere. And, it, but I think also the simplicity to go back to the beginning of the story, this guy in an industrial park in Connecticut, not part of any scientific mm -hmm. community working entirely alone coming up with a simple idea. I call him the Ringo star of inventors instead of adding stuff to blood, to clot blood, which is everybody had done for millennia centuries. Let's just take something away. Right. So addiction, addition by subtraction. And again, I think that the scientific community leave alone the military community is fascinated by complicated, you know, nuclear stuff. This guy just came up with something utterly brilliant and simple there. I say in the book that people have won the Nobel prize for less. Frank Hersey will never win the Nobel prize and it works against him. He's gotten recognition largely through the book, but until the book, he was mentioned once in scientific American, hmm. a, a three sentence paragraph in, in 2003. That was the only scientific recognition. You're a doctor you know, you can you can do one small thing and get 10 journal articles if you know how to position yourself. And so the, there's still and part of the lesson of this is moving things forward so that the next Frank Hersey and Bart Gulong won't have to go through this effing 10 year struggle that cost them blood, psychological blood. Um, and one of the morals of the story is follow the data. Right. And the other part of the story is let's not repeat history. This is the Wright brothers story in 2002. The Wright brothers, you know the story, they were high school grads, they were bicycle makers, they were practical makers. They weren't theorists, but they did something that worked. But if you really dig into the story, it was years after Kitty Hawk that they got the contract. Mm -hmm. It was something like seven years later they were shut out by the establishment in in DC. They were about to get a contract from the French military, and finally, the Department of Defense gave them a contract. Is literally like the same sort of time frame. It was like eight to ten years. So we see them as heroes, and they, you know, but they were they were written off even after Kitty Hawk. So we've got to move the, the football down the field a little bit better. And, and working with Bart, we worked so closely over the last three years and continue to work together. We've become very good friends. Um, his mantra was, uh, it wasn't easy to write the book, tons of research. I interviewed him a hundred times. I think he counted every minute. Um, but one of the, our touchstones was, let's make it easier for the next Frank Hersey uh, that they don't have to go through this again. And the book has gotten out there. So I think we, we, we may contribute to that. I like the blueprint idea of this book. I like the idea of it's not just for this application, but there are a lot of people that have really great ideas. You know, one thing about the army is they teach you in the beginning when you're young is keep it simple, stupid. But then I think they lose that along the way. Then they, at the, it seems like at the end of career, people are like, well, let's be as complicated as possible and uh, put our own spin on everything. And you kind of lose concept of it. I really appreciate you guys coming on. And I really looking forward to reading this book and getting a message out there. It's our pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely. Every opportunity to get quick clot into another set of hands is another opportunity for it to save a life. Thanks so much for having us, Jason. We really appreciate it.